Yeehaw! Welcome back to Outlaws of Alchemstar GM Prep with Steve. I just wanted to thank you. I know it's been a little while since my first upload. Um, there's been about a month before I got around to Chapter 2. It's been a crazy month. Um, I do plan to do these bi-weekly going forward. That's the tentative schedule. Um, so I don't generally expect to go this long between episodes. So thanks for waiting it out. Unless you're watching from the future and you're just binging the series and it was like 30 seconds for you. I'm sorry that 30 seconds felt like a month. Uh, today we're going to be covering uh, chapter one, which is called Reach for the Sky. Pew, pew, pew. Um, and uh, yeah, chapter one is essentially a good old fashioned Wild West bank robbery and getaway rolled into one with a outdoor dungeon thrown in for good measure. It's a, it's a good time. It's a good introduction to the setting for your players. And I think, uh, I think that is, a, a it's a fun way to hit the ground running, especially because they give you different options on how you can start it. Um, let me pull up really quick. Let me switch the view just so you can see for a second the web browsers, we can go over the what they consider the chapter one summary. So chapter one <clears throat> synopsis. The characters join forces to rob the gold tank reserve, an illicit banking operation owned by their despicable rival Ambrose Mugland to evade capture at the hands of the corrupt shield marshals who work for Mugland's ally, Deputy Angelique Loveless. Uh, the party must race to the nearby whaling scrapyard. Only by surviving the hazards and monsters of this massive junkyard can the party hope to reach safety back at the Barrel and Bullet Saloon. And that is the, the overall synopsis, and I think that's a good uh, good synopsis and a good overview for what's to come. Um, so <clears throat> before we actually jump in and get rolling on this, I do need to give a huge shout out to all of our Patreon subscribers here at Recall Knowledge. Um, our Patreon subscribers make this sort of content possible uh, and really fuel everything we do on this channel. So a huge shout out to everyone here that is our current Patreon as of this morning. That includes David Sim, Derek Brewer, Sandra Wagner, Michelle Waltz, and Jason Irvin. Uh, you guys are what make this sort of video possible at all. And if you are a GM at home and you are enjoying this style of video, consider heading on over to patreon.com slash recall knowledge, supporting us, helping us and me to make this content for you and getting your name here in the shout outs as well. We also do have a Patreon goal right now, like a stretch goal, which I committed to, which is if we hit $100, we will go back and finish the entirety of the Abomination Vault's Adventure Path. Uh, I did chapter, I did the first book. So there's still two more books I can cover that I never got around to. Um, it's picking up steam. Abomination Vaults is, is really popular. If you're considering running it, head on over, support, push us over the goal, and we will start making those content videos as well. Uh, so thank you, everyone, on our Patreon. So... Chapter one, reach for the sky. To start, we need to understand in this adventure path a few of the important characters that are going to drive this story. Uh, in fact, there are three main ones that you need to know going into chapter one that the books don't do. I mean, if you just sat down and read the first chapter, it might be hard to piece all this together. I wanted to kind of collectively, over the course of all three books, because since the last video I recorded, the third book, Smoking Gun, has come out, so I now have at least read through and have a clearer picture of how the entire story goes together than I did last video. Um, I wanted to pull my thoughts on these characters and give you a nice overview so that anywhere you are in this adventure path, you will have this character, their goals, their personalities in their mind and help you react to any crazy shenanigans your players are sure to try. Mine have put me through the ringer. So let's start off with Phoebe Dunsmith. Um, 
Phoebe is seen here, and that is, uh, she is a dwarf. Let me just grab some of these other PDFs to get them loaded, because I haven't fully loaded them yet. So, Phoebe Dunsmith is openly, right, she is a simple proprietor of a bar. She is a fixer. She is an underground contact, somebody who puts jobs together, somebody who can get you a firearm, you know, by non-legal means. Uh, and she is the kind of person that knows a lot of shady people, okay? On the secret side of her life, she is actually an undercover agent for Alkenstar. She is a personal friend and contact of the Grand Duchess, that is the elected official who is in charge of the entire council and government in the city. And she basically reports back all the stuff that's going on in the underworld to the city so they can, you know, weed out the, you know, the dangerous criminals. She's kind of like undercover informant, uh, and she will be the patron for the entire adventure path, which pulls the players, characters, the outlaws in and either willingly or unwillingly forces them to work for her and work for the city. So what is Phoebe all about? She's a dwarf. She owns a tavern called the Barrel and Bullet Saloon. Uh, she has a huge flair for the dramatic. Uh, we see this at the beginning of the chapter. She has a play night in her tavern where everyone comes and watches the dramatic retelling of this story this serial that's a weekly event and she loves this like this is kind of her passion project like yeah she has the bar yeah she has the uh the secret life of the agent but like what does she do for fun who is phoebe she's a theater nerd she wants to be overly dramatic she wants her life to be a soap opera and she really just hangs on that drama and you see this a lot in her dialogue and a lot in the sort of reveals and the way that she, you know, reveals who she is to the players at the start of chapter two. So the big thing about her and her ultimate goal and her ultimate drive is she loves Alkenstar. But she loves Alkenstar so much that in her mind, the ends justify the means, right? She will gladly do terrible things horrible things if she believes the end result is better for Alkenstar. That includes probably killing people. That includes, you know, kidnapping people. That includes staging robberies. That includes, you know, frame, like, what do you call it? Uh, entrapping a party and forcing them to work for her. Because she loves Alkenstar so much, she sees her job as utterly important. She will do, you know, whatever it takes. Now, it is clear that, that she tells the the party, I don't, you know, no murder, no wanton recklessness, no, you know, no being evil, but do what you need to do to get the job done, whatever it takes. Um, and most of all, she's not afraid to force others to do what she wants, even if it means playing dirty. So Phoebe have this image of her that should drive, that should drive her like character i believe the most um there is other options here like the way the book reveals it is that she reveals right away that ah, i'm a secret agent ha 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 um if your party is all outlaws and your party doesn't like the government and doesn't like the the alkenstar city you don't have to like play this uh, her as such an open book right um let her save that trump card for when she sort of needs to be like no you have to do the adventure i set in front of you but overall, she uh, she will do whatever she feels is best, regardless of the cost. Uh, let me let me actually switch this uh, view. How do you do this page? Boom! There we go. That's a little better. Okay, so Phoebe, she's gonna be uh, giving the PCs every adventure in chapter in book one. She gives all the PCs their their adventure in book two, and she continues throughout the book three, and kind of gives the missions that the PCs are gonna go. So. She's going to be around for the entirety of the adventure path. She's probably the NPC you're going to roleplay the most with your party. So, you know, get comfortable, pick an accent, pick a personality, and be ready to do a lot of Phoebe over the course of the adventure path. Up next, 
the halfling we love to hate, Ambrose Mugland. Uh, let me switch this page. Here we go. Ambrose Mugland is a little halfling. He is a businessman that has essentially no sense of loyalty whatsoever to anyone in his past, in his present, or in his future. His title here, you see Cutthroat Underworld Mogul. That describes him pretty well. Um, he His backstory is, is basically he comes from a rich family. He uh, learned at a very young age on how to take advantage of stupid rich people. Uh, so he would sort of scam or con the rich people that were in his life into giving him more money. Uh, and he's a, a smooth talker, very high sort of charisma. We can see charisma plus four on his stat block. Um, and by doing this, right, by by using his sweet talking, learning how to manipulate people in the rich circles, he took that to the underworld and built up a ton of friends, contacts, people like street level, low level criminals. He became the guy to know. He connected people. He had his fingers in all the jobs. Uh, and he had a good reputation on the street. What did he do with that reputation? He traded it all in, betrayed, uh, betrayed is not the right word, but he basically stepped on all of them and leveraged that into becoming a underworld mob boss. All his friends, anyone that was with him before did not come up with him. He didn't bring his friends up and make them his like closest allies. He used them and discarded them and got to be a powerful rich sort of underworld contact. Now, the real interesting thing is if you were to hear Muglin tell the story, he is one of the most successful underworld cutthroat mogul businessmen criminals in the entire city. But if you were to ask someone from the outside in, he's barely mid-level, right? Yeah, he's probably rich, but a lot of that comes from his rich background. It's more that he thinks he's a bigger deal than he really is. Um, but what this also means is he has no qualms with with taking his current friends and his current allies and stepping on them to get to what he believes is also the next level, to move up the ladder. And we see this a lot in, in the sort of um, adventure path uh, where from the outside in, he seems like he's got it all together, but on the inside, he's actually barely holding it together he's going bankrupt he has no more money left he can't pay the gangs the money he's promised them he's being taken kidnapped and uh, held hostage and trying to like squirm his way out of things he uh he ends up not being a big big deal in the adventure path now let me qualify this he is the book two boss so he will be the big showdown that the pcs have to face in book two and he he features prominently in most of the backgrounds and the 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 sort of what made you an outlaw backgrounds. Who's your enemy? He's going to be that enemy for a lot of people in your party probably. And that's fine. Uh, but just know that uh, that there are – he is still just a mid-level, thinks he's more important than he really is sort of crim like mob boss. Uh, and in terms of chapter one coming into this chapter – uh, the bank that's being robbed at the start, he's actually the person that owns that bank. Uh, Phoebe is sending the PCs in to, to sort of rob enough money to help finance their future operations, plus striking a strong blow against Mugland and leveraging the, the party's hate of Mugland to get them to do what she wants. So, um, so that is Ambrose Mugland. He will be a thorn in your party's side, mostly kind of heard about, talked about until they finally show down with him at the end of book two and chapter, like it's like the seventh adventure chapter in book two or seventh adventure chapter in the entire AP. Um, but yeah, he, he ends up actually surprising me, not being the big fish, not being the brains of the operation, not being the brains of the adventure path. That title goes to this outlaw this this star right here that is um that is angelique loveless the shield marshal herself she is uh you know 
sort of a corrupt shield marshal. Um, and that's like, this is, this is why it's interesting. Not until we got to book three, did I really get a clear view of her because reading the player's guide in chapter one and chapter or book one and book two, I really thought she was just a corrupt person that wanted to get rich. Right. And she, you know, was writing Muglin's coattails and, uh, turns out that couldn't be further from the truth. She is actually the brains of the operation. She is the mastermind of the entire scheme, the entire uh, driving plot for the Adventure Path. And she becomes the primary villain and the final villain, showdown, boss, whatever you want to call it, at the end of the entire Adventure Path for good reason. And uh, let me just cover sort of what I, what I, you should know about Angelique and... Let me tell you what I've learned after reading book three. So, first of all, she was a shield marshal for about 100 years. She is an elf. You can see her elven features. She lives a long time. She's been a shield marshal for 100 years, and she's protected the Alkenstar Wastelands. It's, now, this is important to note. The shield marshals are not just the police force within the city. They are the standing army. They keep law and order in the entirety of the region. The mana waste, the gun works, all the cities that make up the region they kind of do all of that fight the mutant invasions and all of that right so she has done a great job of quelling all of that rising in the ranks and just generally being known as a good shield marshal that keeps law in order uh despite the fact that she sort of in recent years has become a little corrupt in terms of maybe taking it too far sometimes she actually truly does want to bring stronger law to this lawless reason, her, her region. Her primary goal in this adventure path and everything she's done is to make sure that Alkenstar's army grows. Okay? Um, her other secret and sort of why she sort of gets into this weirdness is she's a changeling. She has two different color eyes in all her artwork which is a telltale sign of a changeling, right, in Pathfinder. Now, if you come from 5e like me, changeling there means I can shapeshift my body and turn it completely. Changeling in Pathfinder lore is different. It is not, oh, I can change my shape and shapeshift and become a doppelganger. No, no, no. Changelings here just means your mother was a hag. So, in this case, her mother was a hag. Uh, her father, or sort of, the person who raised her as a father, there's a whole lore backstory, but was actually a paladin of Osiris. And he was tricked by the hag into raising her, um, even though the paladin knew the hag was trying to trick him. He tried to do the right thing. He raised Angelique and taught her honor, lawfulness, how to be good, how to protect people. Um, and then when she kind of came of age, the hag told her to kill her father, and Angelique wouldn't. She sort of killed the hag instead, um, but not before the father. her father died too, and so she was left with no parents. Um, and what she did is she took her father's holy sword and melted it down at the gunworks into the pistol you see her holding here right above me. This pistol is kind of imbued with her father's goodness and spirit. And then she took the staff from the hag and turned it into this long rifle, the one she uses here, her most feared weapon. So she kind of has this duality of goodness that she was taught and her inherent hag nature that makes her distrust people and just kind of selfish and evil, right? Um, so even though that will probably never come up to your players organically, it's good for you to know, right? She's a tormented, driven person that thinks she's doing the right thing but she has a twisted sense in her head of what is right and wrong because of this hag nature it's pretty cool uh, i wish i would have known a little bit more at the beginning uh, about that but you know if you're watching this you probably have time to incorporate that version of her into your uh into your uh world um she did spend a long time taming the wilds uh but recently she's kind of come into the city more and she's been more in contact with humanity as a whole. Um, I think what happens here is as she sees humanity up close, she actually 
begins to sort of despise them. She doesn't see them as worthy of protection or worthy of, you know, of, uh, of mercy. She has, you know, a hundred years is enough to become detached from the short lives of the, the humans and stuff. Um, and that ruthless hag conscience in her head is sort of clashing with the virtuous father's teachings of wanting to uphold the law. So this entire adventure path is driven by her plans. And her plans are she wants to plan a terrorist attack on the city. Pyronite is her way to do that. She sort of gets the Pyronite, wants to get the Pyronite, and she wants to orchestrate someone to buy it. She gets the people that are the most feared, despised enemies of Alkenstar, the neighbors, Nex and Geb. And she wants to orchestrate a selling to those two nations. But keep in mind, this is all a planned operation. She doesn't really want to like ship the Pyronite off to those countries and let them do their thing. She just wants to use those countries against each other, against the city, like in a way that she thinks that she will be able to control. So she gets someone from Nex. She gets someone from Geb. They all three work together. But she plans to off all of them. You know, she's going to off each one of them as they do what she wants, which is load a boat with Pyronite, place it on the Falcon Star Falls in the city, and explode it. By doing that, by not really meaning to take down the city, but just threatening the city, this sort of, I guess what you would call like a false flag operation, like, you know, the, the U.S. government sinking a battleship off the coast so they can declare war on the country, right? She wants to scare or shake the apathy out of what she thinks is apathy in the city and shake the people into action. She wants to grow the standing army, which in recent years has lost 200 shield marshals, right, due to corruption that were ousted. She wants to bolster those ranks, make them bigger, reduce the reliance on clockwork, and instate herself as sort of the leader of that army and bring what she thinks is true lawfulness to an otherwise lawless region. Now we do get some glimpses of what that looks like in book three, courtesy of Flash Forwards If the Party Fails. It involves her in a mobile uh, fortress wandering in the wasteland as the ultimate warlord. Is that a better like world than we live in now? It's, it's clearly meant not to be, but different people might interpret it differently. Uh, it's definitely not a nice one for anyone who she deems to be not, you know, not on her side, which is probably everyone thanks to her hag nature. So in the end, the PCs have to thwart her plot uh, and then do with her what they may at the end. Uh, and she's an interesting character, uh, more interesting than I gave her credit for knowing her early. Um, as far as how she goes in the AP, at least in chapter one that we're going to be reading, she's there at the bank. Now, this is the important, right? She's at the bank. She will be there to scare the PCs away. She's the final boss of the whole campaign, and they see her in, like, essentially the first scene or the first part of the adventure. So she will be present sort of as this, this threat nagging from a distance, but they shouldn't face her down because she's, like, you know, she's got, like, a level 10 or a level 11 stat block. They're not ready for that. They don't know that necessarily. So never, never tempt your party into actually facing her down because it will not go well for them. Okay, so let's let's uh, let's switch over here to uh, my Foundry instance because I do have this world in Foundry. Uh, chapter one, Reach for the Sky. I hope uh, I hope at least you know I hope those gives you the three most important characters that you should know going into your first session. Uh, at least the, the broad strokes for those three. And then you can drill down to the specifics as you read more and as you have more time to prepare. So how do we start this adventure path? Uh, the book actually gives um, a couple of options. Um, so let's see. It's funny because like chapter two it's really chapter two is reach for the sky, but it's chapter one reach for the sky. Um, 
there's there's two ways that it proposes getting started, which is you know common for an adventure path. Like how do you start? There's many different ways. The first way is like you know the standard way. You all meet in the tavern, right? As written, you guys are meeting in the Bullet and Barrel Saloon. Phoebe has reached out to you because of your hatred for Ambrose or Loveless and invited you to meet a bunch of strangers because she's putting a job together and she needs you to be on her crew. And that is, um, you know, the adventuring party, which I'll refer to as the outlaws for the rest of this. Uh, and that's just your standard trope, right? You meet in the tavern, introduce your character, you know, give them the mission, send them out, let them prepare to go. Um, but they also give an option for a more action pack start, which is sort of the... Well, think about this, right? If you were watching a movie, like a heist movie, a criminal movie, uh, does the first scene of your movie start with everyone sitting around talking about the job they're going to do, or does it start with the actual robbery? I want to say both are valid options. I'm pretty sure most of these movies, even something like Reservoir Dogs, which very clearly one of the first scenes is everyone sitting around talking about the job in a diner. Um, you still start with the action. You start with the flash forward. You start with, with like, get the audience hooked. And in this case, they propose starting with uh, straight to the action. You come in in the middle of the bank robbery. You just have the players... Um, kicking in the door, like shooting their guns in the air and saying, you know, reach for the sky, give me all your money, I need to rob your bank. And then you kind of do flashback scenes to explain what's going on, why they're here. Both are very valid options, depending on your group, depending on the tone you want to set. Uh, just know that if you uh, start straight to the action, people will probably just be a little confused as to why we're robbing this bank. If you do the lead in um, as written, PCs might not want to go to the bank right away. They might be super cautious and it won't feel as action packed. There's no right or wrong way. Just find the way that works for you and, and do it. So when I ran it, I did the way as written. I introduced the characters to the world, the opening monologue, dropped them into the scene and let them go. Most of my players, we had done some prequel series, so they knew each other as characters. This was the first time they'd seen each other in months. So it was like a chance for them to sort of, you know, meet back up and get together. Um, and uh, they felt almost like rushing them into the bank job was like, you know, like, I don't want to go there right now. I want to meet up with these characters and, and catch up. Uh, other people might just want to get going as fast as they can and have the bank robbery finish in the first session. Figure out what you want and go from there. So um, make sure at this point, right, we've talked about this before, make sure you're PCs are following the sort of player's guide outline, which is to say, you know, if your character's lawful good and they come into the first scene, if he was like, I need you to rob a bank, they're going to say, no, I don't want to do that. I'm out of here, right? And that'll, okay, you know, it ruins the, the flow of the AP. Uh, the, the PCs should have an outlaw status. Uh, Phoebe is also the kind of person that in this scene should be seen as a friend in the face. She should, they shouldn't think of her as any more than like a criminal contact putting a job together. She's not meant to be anything more than that. So make sure that they like her because they're going to be attached to her for like many, many, many sessions. Uh, and um, everything Phoebe does, she tries to orchestrate to have them do it in these private rooms in her bar that are like soundproofed, which unbeknownst to the party, at least at the beginning of the campaign, should be, they're all bugged. She records everything that goes on in there so she can play it back later, listen to the secrets that the PCs are, are dropping, use it to kind of press their pressure points and get them to do what she wants. Uh, so make sure she's always always being two-faced about everything she does, right? Um, but yeah, that is, that is um, the two ways to start the adventure path. Um, either way, in this chapter, there are... In, in, in chapter one, Reach for the Sky, there's two... Well, I guess there's three scenes. There's the Bullet and Barrel Saloon, and there's a whole chapter um, in the book at the end of the chapter, uh, which is, um, let's see. I'll just share the, the map of the saloon so you can see it. This is sort of the Bullet and Barrel Saloon with the nice foundry updated maps that they have. Um, give it a second to load. 
you know, there's a battle map here. There's no actual combat that should take place here um, as written, but there's plenty of uh, role play opportunities here. So this bullet and barrel sort of becomes a character in your campaign. For the start of this campaign and start of chapter one, it only is there as like a lore dump for Phoebe to be like, hey, we're doing this mission, go off and do it. But as they come back here, they can stay here, they can lay low here, they can meet a lot of side characters here. So this should be almost like the bullet and barrel saloon becomes, sorry, the barrel and bullet saloon becomes a character in and of itself more so than, than almost anything else. But for chapter one, not as important, right? It's just the, the exposition dump location. The, uh, the actual first, uh, first scenes, the two most important scenes to run chapter one are the gold tank reserve, which is the bank that's being robbed and the whaling scrapyard, which is the getaway zone after the PCs do the robbery. So Phoebe's going to tell them, go to the bank. We know that security is low, right? There, there's usually a bunch of clockworks, which um, if, if you've seen right, clockworks are automated sort of wind up toys that can do simple tasks. They're not they don't have an AI, they don't think, but they can do stuff like guard, right, and attack anyone that comes around. So what it is is the bank, which normally has a lot more clockworks, has, like, most of them out for repair, and there's going to be, like, a one-night window where the PCs can rob the bank um, as long as they get there, like, right at the beginning of the bank opening the next morning before they're delivered. So there's a window here. The window ends up being 12 hours from when Phoebe tells them and you start the mission. She says, you have 12 hours to rob the bank. I suggest doing some some prep tonight, scout it out, learn some stuff, sleep, wake up the next morning, and go for it. Um, players might have other plans, right? P players might actually want to go rob the bank at night, right? Maybe your players are like mine and they want less chance of like collateral damage. So if we rob the bank at night, we're not no less people are gonna get hurt. The problem is robbing a bank is actually much easier during the day than it is at night and the author vanessa hoskins she uh she knows a little bit about this and i believe this works in the bank herself and yeah robbing the bank during the day that's when most people rob banks because the vaults are open the people with the codes are there you don't have to be you know you don't have to beat like super high lock security you just gotta you know get the tellers to do what you want uh so you got to be on your toes here. You don't know what your players are going to do unless you go back to the start and just start them robbing the bank in the middle of the day as sort of expected and written. Then they're got, they have no choice but to do it, right? So uh, anyways, this, this here, right, is something that I think is important that uh, is kind of glossed over in the book. And that is Ironside Quarter and where the bank is actually located. So Alkenstar as a whole has this giant walled city. Pretty well protected from the mana waste and from raiders. And Ironside Quarter used to be part of the city. This outside wall was the original wall of Alkenstar. Mutants got in there. There was like a plague that got in there. Um, basically, the whole thing was lost. I believe it was mostly like a plague. They ended up burning down the entire quarter and building a new wall to seal it off from the rest of the city. And this is, you know, going back 20-something years in the lore. So this, this in Pathfinder 1st Edition, was all abandoned. And there is, like, a single gate that gets you in and out that is guarded by the military because it's a, you know, it's a point where their weakest defenses and someone could get into the city. But otherwise, it's kind of abandoned. It's, it's left alone. It's not actually patrolled by the, the law. It's not really protected from the mana storms as much. It's not protected from uh, dangerous things or the police. And this is where the bank lives. So I believe, generally speaking, the idea is Ironside Quarter is slowly being rebuilt from its years before. And that is why this, you know, Muglin has opened the bank here. Um, but it also explains why it's so abandoned, why nobody's around when you're robbing it. The reason this is important, and you can make it as important or as unimportant as you want, the PCs 
to rob this bank are leaving the safety of the city. They're about to walk through this gate out into the mana waste, which is, is like kind of crazy to begin with, right? And they are going to do that as the, like the, the, the watch, the, the shield marshals are watching them. <laughs> hey, <laughs> Richard's in chat, like peeping. Uh, and the book will never mention this, right? That, that it's actually outside the city in this like abandoned quarter. Um, so it can be kind of half rebuilt. It can be fully abandoned as much as you want. And, you know, maybe you give some of your players a chance to shine. Uh, but what's really apparent no matter what is as they go into the city and they rob a bank, they can't just steal the loot and run back into the city, right? Everything's going to be on high alert. They're going to be carrying like gold. People are going to be chasing them. Uh, it's, it's getting back into the city is not as easy as getting out of the city with a loot. And the reason this is important is because Phoebe tells them, Hey, after you rob the bank, head on over to the, the scrapyard next door, hop into the sewers, go under the tunnels and pop up in the city and get back. This is really meant to be their primary way to get back, but it's not always clear to the players that, Hey, we're going to an unsafe place to do this. So really sort of play that up because it comes into play later with the scrapyard stuff and it explains why they can't just like, well, why can't we just walk back with the cash after we rob it? Because, hey, Ironside is a burned down, abandoned place that's not actually part of the city. So as I said before, a bank is so much easier to rob during the day than it is at night and that is reflected in the defenses and the layout. So as the book is written, it's assuming your party comes in during the day because that is sort of how uh, Phoebe tells them to do it. But of course, my players, they went and they uh, <laughs> they wanted to go in at night. Um, but that's fine. You can roll with the punches. So this is what the bank looks like. The main feature is, of course, the vault. This is the vault. It's in the middle of the room. It's got this giant lock sealed door, an inner cage locked here. It requires a key from a teller on one end. And um, it also requires a key from the manager on the other end. And in addition to that, the entire spinny wheel is a, um, a combination lock. So I believe maybe it's just the teller turns the key and the manager puts in the combination. But it requires both together to, uh, to, to do it, right? Both sets of keys. Um, other than that, um, there is an employee area in the back. There's a bunch of lockers where the employees have some fun little knickknacks in the lockers. Uh, there's a door that leads from the back alley into the, um, into the employee room. So if your PCs want to sneak around back, this is a good entry point to get into the bank. Um, and there are two managers office up front. These are not, not managers. These are loan officers offices full with some goodies. And in the back, the, uh, Irkham Dresch, she's the dwarven manager who, uh, manages this place. And she's, you know, an underworld criminal. Um, and she's got some fun, uh, some fun moves. We'll cover her stat block in a second, but the main defense, whether they come in at night or the day is the gold tank brokers. So if you read as it's written, right? to patrol the front during daylight hours anyone that has any sort of weapons they will attack otherwise you can just waltz past them and come into the bank right um at night they're definitely in patrol mode and they will attack anything that's you know anything they don't recognize um and then during the day they lock two of the gold they lock two of the the guys in this vault and then when the vault is opened you know if the manager doesn't like escort them or tell them it's okay they're just going to open fire so most likely what happens is your PCs come in, try to rob the bank, get into a fight with these brokers, get into a fight with all these people in the lobby that defend the bank. Then when they finally get into the vault, there's another showdown with the brokers as well as a showdown with the manager um, in the middle of it, right? If they come in at night, you have to adjust this a bit. These still patrol the front, right? But these two are no longer in the vault. These two are meant to patrol the inner sort of bank and if for some reason your pcs wait until all of the rest of the clockers are repaired and, and re like returned you can probably expect less like more than four probably closer to like eight 
clockwork to make it even impossible. So the fact there's only four clockworks defending it is why this is their window to rob the bank. Uh, clockworks themselves are level one creatures. Um, they're modified from like the typical clockworks and that normally have like non-lethal damage, the ones that the, the shield marshals use. Here, these ones are definitely going to use lethality. Uh, they do have attack of opportunity, which at first level creatures is really, you know, important. Um, important to note because it's going to catch a lot of Pathfinder uh, veterans off guard. And they have the ability to sort of tie people up. They can do a siren. They have, you know, you basically hit with a melee attack, grab, hog tie them, and go, yeehaw! And then you got your your sort of uh, hog tied PCs that have to break off or uh, break out of it. Um, they also have, you know, they have resistance to physical damage and weakness to electricity damage, like all clockworks do. Um, they're, they're a good introduction to clockworks. It is important to remember that clockworks have to be wound up, and that also means they can be wound down. So anyone can use a, um, basically a thievery check to do a disable a device, just like it was a trap. And you can do, um... Here we can see it's a DC 15 thievery check to wind these down. If you're feeling generous, you could also extend this to be like crafting check with maybe a slightly higher DC, uh, just because crafters know the inner workings of how it works. Um, but it really, the reason it's thievery is right, winding down a creature that's in the midst of like moving around is not, it, it requires some dexterous finesse. Uh, it is weird though, right? Because it says that these things can wind up for 24 hours, right? The every it can run for 24 hours on one wind up, and when you wind down, it only winds down like an hour of the time, but that's probably more than you really want to micromanage. So you can pretty much just sort of say like a solid check probably winds them down completely, depending on how generous or how dire the situation is. You got to be a little flexible with uh with that one remember with the grab action on a creature if you hit with a melee attack you can spend an action to grab automatically right if the melee attack hits one more action automatically grabs uh, but otherwise they're pretty straightforward 16 ac uh 16 hit points they're gonna be a handful for new players or for low level players but nothing they can't manage with a bit of uh of careful planning and, and cooperation one other key defense assuming your pcs come during the day is urkum dresh urkum this uh dwarven banker back here she sits in her office gets her shotgun out and holds it at the door the first pc to open the door gets blasted and then she joins the fray um she is a level three creature so in you know pcs are level one this is a single creature that's two levels higher. That's a tough fight at level one. Creature plus two is already pretty tough most of the time. I think it's even skewed a bit for being tough for level one. So Urkham Drush has the potential to be dangerous to your party. And it wouldn't be a Pathfinder Adventure Path with overtuned things in the first chapter of Adventure, right? Urkham Drush is the first potential thing that they will face that is going to be tough. Uh, she has 37 hit points, 19 AC, but this is what I like about her the most, is her defying glare. She's so stubborn, as dwarves can be, that when a creature uses a mental effect against her and they fail, or critical fails, she, as a reaction, shoots them a defying glare and can demoralize them uh, right as a reaction. Um, it becomes it loses the auditory trait, becomes a visual trait. They don't have to understand her language, although most PCs will. Uh, it's just funny, right? Like you try to affect her, she turns it back on you. I like that. As well, what do you imagine a banker does, right? They have lots of money. So she has this passive called generous distraction, which says she can use the promise of wealth to distract her foes. So when she critically succeeds on a deception check, to faint against somebody within 30 feet, the target becomes flat-footed to her ranged attacks and her melee strikes. So, for, for um, you know, she makes a faint attack. It'll, usually a faint only works in melee. This allows her to turn the faint into a ranged attack ability as well. 
but this pairs very nicely with silver shower shot once per round she can throw 2d6 of her silver pieces right if you look at her inventory she carries 12 gold pieces worth of no, wait, she carries actually she doesn't say but she she theoretically has uh she should have silver pieces on her and maybe it's in her desk she throws in the air they scatter and by throwing the money in the air that's how she does the faint and it faints against a creature within 30 feet so uh you know normally um So with one action, the silver shot allows her to make the feint and attack in one strike, right? One action. So usually she has to reload her gun and it takes a whole action to reload the gun. But because she can then do the feint and strike with one action, it's how she sort of gets back that action economy in a fun, interesting way that allows her to strike against targets being flat-footed. And it's a fun moment for your PCs when the silver gets in the air. You know, they go for the coins, they get blasted. It's just funny. It kind of fits the theme of the bank robbery, right? Um, all of that together combines with her sneak attack, right? She gets precision damage against flat-footed targets. They're flat-footed from the money in the air. It allows her to do a decent amount of damage and be a big threat against your PCs. Uh, there's a bit of a caveat here, right? If the PCs come at night, they need her keys to sort of get into the vault, right? But, or to get the combination. The combination is very hard to get on, on its own. But she won't be here at night. Some people have her sleeping here at night, which works. Maybe she lives in the office. Um, what I did is I had her ledger, which she does have a ledger that the PCs can kind of loot and take back to Phoebe that kind of gives her more information about them. Um, she is able to, uh, I have like in that ledger, all of the, it's like the HR book, right? It has the names and addresses of all the employees, including Irkham Dresh. So if your PC's break in at night, you realize they can't get into the vault. They have a list of name and addresses. They can then go back and kidnap the people and bring them back here and force them to do what they want. Just as an option, if that works for your table and in the moment you need a, a bailout uh, <laughs> a idea, go ahead and use that one. Otherwise, you know, the uh, to get into the bank vault, um, I believe it's three consecutive DC-20 thievery checks. The funny thing is, think about breaking a combination vault, right? It takes a long time. Right? You got to stop. You got to listen. You got to like... Ch -ch -ch -ch. Realistically, I think this should be a... It, it really should be an exploration activity, right? Uh, the lock should take 10 minutes per check. And each check should be a DC 20. And if you get, you know, if you fail one, it resets the tumblers. I do feel like as you get successful in a row, you should probably reduce the DC to get those numbers because they figure out the numbers as they go. I don't think this makes sense to like break the combination in the middle of like a battle per se, which is what happened in my game. The PCs were fighting off the the robots, the, the clockworks, while the other PCs were trying to break into the vault. It really doesn't make logical sense to break a combination lock and try to guess a combination and listen as a two action activity, but that's all it's written as, right? So consider making it harder. Consider that breaking into the vault should take a long period of time. Make it harder or easier as, as you go. Um, either way, as written, it takes three consecutive DC 20 thievery checks. A failure resets the lock back to the beginning, so you have to start at the beginning and do three in a row again. Uh, without any sort of immediate danger, it really doesn't make sense to sort of just have them rolling dice over and over and over, other than the fact that you could say, guys, the bank, it's the middle of the night, the bank's going to run out, the sun's coming up, the workers are going to be here soon, you're running out of time. So it is... It should necess it should basically be impossible to open. But if they do get it open, you know, you can do that. Open the door like that. Uh, inside the vault, the uh, the bank vault has an ornate steel box with 10 bulk. 10 bulk is more than most adventurers can handle, especially at level 1. Uh, they're supposed to have a bag of holding. They can shove it in. Um, have, play that up. Have fun. But otherwise, this is pretty straightforward. You just need to make sure you understand the clockworks, how their resistance works. Uh, the grab and hog tie, Urkham Dresh and her whole kit and how it all ties together. Uh, and you'll have a nice, fun experience at the Gold Tank Reserve.
So, let's talk about the second location, and that is the Whaling Scrapyard. Whaling Scrapyard is a, you know, it's an abandoned scrapyard. Abandoned, right? It's abandoned in terms of the people in the city don't care about it, but it's a scrapyard in the Ironside District, right? So it's still outside the city proper, and it's just down the street from this bank. Uh, at the end, oh yeah, I guess I should call it, talk about this. After the PCs, you know, whenever they get the gold, that's when the law shows up. So Angelique Loveless and all the shield marshals will show up, and that's the oh shit panic button. We need to get out of here. Angelique will be chasing after your PCs as they make their scene transition from the gold tank reserve to the whaling scra scrapyard. As it's written, there's no mechanics here. It's just a narrative moment. You explain what's happening. The feedback I got from my group was that scene when Angelique was chasing us didn't feel, you know, it didn't feel like we had a chance to do anything. It just felt like we we were told what was happening and not allowed to make decisions. Um, and my, my kind of counter to that was like, well, yeah, because it's not really meant to be a decision making. You realize that's the level 10 NPC that you're going to fight at the end of the adventure path, right? Um, but they don't realize that at the time, right? They have no idea. It feels like maybe they should be able to show down with Angelique. Um, either way, it ends as they run down the street into the scrapyard. Um, the goblins there have them topple this like large tower of trash over, blocks the entrance, and for some reason, the shield marshals are unable to get into the scrapyard uh, for eight plus hours while the PCs can clear it out and do the dungeon. Just make sure narratively they realize the shield marshals are still coming after them, trying to climb, clear out the trash, um, and light a little bit of fire under their butts, right? But that is where the second sort of place is. It's called the Whaling Scrapyard. Also, you know, like I said, in the Ironside Quarter. Um, it looks like this, right? It's It's... It's a bunch of piles of trash that create 10 foot tall walls that as written can be scaled. It's just that if you scale it and fail or critically fail, you're getting cut and exposing yourself to tetanus and taking damage. If your party are all very athletic or clever and find a way to get over these scrap piles, they can make this sort of excursion really quick. If your PCs want to uh, are unable to climb it, they got to kind of go through the sort of gauntlet, which is you know it, it's an it's a dungeon, but it's in an outdoor setting. It's got rooms and sort of challenges that you face head on, um, one after the other. So, um, what is the Whaling Scrapyard? Well, as its name implies, the Whaling Scrapyard is called wailing because it's believed to be haunted. There's like a ghostly spirit that howls and haunts and makes people stay away from it. In fact, this is actually true. There is a ghost that inhabits this main main ship, this main airship here, the Harpy's Kiss. There's a ghost that inhabits the engine block and wails. However, it's not very loud, but the goblins who heard this sort of wailing and the goblins consider this their home, they play it up by like, building a device which is basically like a large like uh speaker system like tube thing that they can blow through and make goblin like scary ghost noises to keep people away so that that is their main defense by scaring people away by pretending it's haunted even though it is haunted goblins are funny like that um so the, these goblins they call themselves the nail gobblers they uh they consider this their home they live here. They don't really deal with outsiders. They don't. They keep to themselves. They go through the scrap. They pick the best scrap. They build cool, interesting things that don't always work. Um, the last sort of person that was in charge uh, created something that blew up and killed him. So the next goblin sort of stepped up and became the uh, the new uh, head. His name is Lord Glass. He's got bits of shards of glass in him. You can see this artwork shows. You know, he's got like a pipe holding extendo arm for no reason other than it's funny. It's just the kind of goblins they are. They're trying to be creative and inventive. And even though their creativity might be weird and misplaced, it is, it is, you know, a community that helps each other and builds things out of what is considered useless garbage by most of civilization. Recently, a group of mutated gnolls have come in here and taken up residence. 
going so far as to go to war with the goblins. Um, the goblins have gotten kind of sick of these murderous gnolls, not only because they're attacking them, but also they're going into the region around and murdering people, and it's being blamed on the goblins, who are very peaceful and want to be kept to themselves. So what they've done here in their safe haven, they sent an envoy, like an ambassador, out to the city to beg for adventurers to come or the city to come and clean up the gnolls. Well, guess what happens? The PCs stumble into this and they think the PCs are the people that they've been waiting for, which leads to some fun, hilarious hijinks when the goblins are expecting the PCs and the PCs are confused and they talk down to the PCs because the PCs don't know what going on, what, what's going on and the goblins think they're smarter because the PCs are dumb. It, it can make some fun little role-play shenanigans here. Um, but that is the primary thing with these, uh, the primary faction with the, uh, the goblins and then... There's a third faction, or sorry, a second faction is the Knolls. So the Knolls camp is like right here. There's five Knolls, four here, one that is currently off um, in Alkenstar, sort of kidnapping people. And um, they are they're from the Mana Waste, which will kind of foreshadow stuff that happens in the second book, which is the Mana Waste warp them, turn them into mutated, uh, let's see. Let's see if I can find the slips by and kill it. Like this is this is what they look like, right? They've got like weird mutated tentacles coming off of them. It's described that they have extra sensory appendages, extra eyes, extra nostrils, mouths. You know, they're just weird. And the sort of magic that corrupted them has also mutated them and made them just outright evil, right? There's no real, as written, there's no talking them down. They see enemies. They capture murder eat everything um and then the artwork we got is for their leader which is bristlebane and this is her and she is the sort of mutated leader we can see she's got multiple eyes like a spider her mouth is maybe a little bit extra wide than it should be uh but really really play up the descriptions of the mana waste uh things uh miwa says flesh warp knolls a little bit yeah uh Unlike a lot of like the flesh warps, which is like you know surgically done on purpose, this is the this sort of flesh warping is from being exposed to this mana waste and the mana storms, and it shows why this region is so deadly because this sort of thing mutates anyone who is left exposed. Unlike the people in the city with who live behind the walls or are mostly protected from this dangerous sort of storm and magic, uh, if you're left to your own devices out in the wild, it's not going to go so good for you. And the fact that pieces have to go there in, in book two is, is kind of a fun foreshadowing for these gnolls specifically. Um, let's see. So third faction, which is an optional faction, is this fungus patch here. There are leshies. Uh, we can see Shum follow uh, this sort of uh, leshy. The artwork's not given in the book, so this is taken from uh, sort of the... Um, uh, there's another source this came from, but I really like this this sort of artwork. It, Leshies are normally kind of seen as cutesy little things. Look how evil this Leshy looks with the weird, evilish eyes coming off the stalk, the like sharp teeth, um, and even the uh, the rest of the Leshies have this sort of like mu uh, mushroom headed uh, look to them with like the, the multiple eyes and the horns coming out of them. Evil sort of, they're not evil, they're, but they're they're not friendly. Let's just say. And uh, they they were here before anyone else, and they are so tired of being trampled on by the gnolls, by the goblins, taking advantage, that they've decided they're not taking it anymore. The next sort of, like, fleshy person that comes through is going to face their wrath. So it's the perfect storm of events for RPCs who show up right in the middle of it and are forced to fight them. It is listed as an optional encounter, so it says... If your PCs are like have are having a hard time, or the PCs are sort of struggling uh, with it, or just ready to move on, skip this encounter. But otherwise, it's a fun encounter to throw at them. Um, I like to play it up right. Uh, these the way they they feed is they kind of go out into the neighboring area and bring in stray pets that get stuck in the fungus, and then sort of. Uh, get dissolved and, and like decayed and mutated or not mutated, uh, decompose rot. And then they like just are eaten by the, the leshies that way. Um, 
but it is talked about how they like sort of lure animals there and then of course the gnolls can go over there and get some of these pets so when they bring the pets in the gnolls are like no no they chase them away they get the pets they bring them over and they eat them themselves um you know they want the pets to sort of grow their fungus patch but the the gnolls are stepping on the leshies and the goblins just disregard them completely so it is it is a sort of huge mess politically speaking so we have these three factions now, this is a good time to call out what I call the Order of Operations. If you were to sit down and read the book and run it with your players and you read the beginning and you got ready and you prepped for the bank and you said, okay, this first session is going to be fun. We're going to do the bank robbery. Now, your players show up and they're told, rob the bank and go to the scrapyard. So what does a smart criminal do? They always secure their getaway. So your PCs say, hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to the scrapyard first. I want to make sure I know where the exit is so that when shit hits the fan, I know how to get there. And if you haven't prepared, if you haven't read ahead, you're in trouble because now your PCs have skipped the first part of the first chapter, gone straight to the second part of the first chapter, and now they're at the scrapyard without having even been to the bank. Uh, that can be a problem if you haven't read ahead. So just know, sort of with an informal poll talking with other GMs when this first dropped, those of us who were running it, right when the adventure first came out given a free choice a majority of groups went to the scrapyard to check out that before they ever went to the bank even if it wasn't like oh we're gonna go you know we just want to go check it out which leads into all this stuff so be prepared that you might have to run the scrapyard earlier than you're ready for read the whole chapter at least have a general overview um and the fun thing is it doesn't really matter, right? If they come here and do all this first before they go rob the bank, well, after they rob the bank, this just becomes a lot easier, right? You just don't topple the trash. Then as they're running in, the shield marshals show up, they topple the trash, they go right through to the exit, get in the sewer, and they're gone. That works just as fine. The only real worry, right, is if they come here right in the morning after a long resting, they go to the scrapyard, and they do all of this, and they get really hurt, and now they got to patch up for like an hour or two. Now their window back at the bank has closed. So the only issue is if they try to do this in the morning before the bank robbery. If it's in the middle of the night, it's probably fine. Just roll with the punches, essentially. Let, the, let them meet with the nail gobblers. Let them explain the whole idea. Let them clear the whole graveyard first if they want. Or just let them know it's not going to be as easy as they want and then double back to the bank. Uh, but it is definitely... Something to be aware of as a potential jam for this adventure path. Um, so let's talk about the Nail Gobblers, who's like one of this main faction who uh, are here at the uh, at the camp. Um, they this is their home, right? They see themselves as the rightful people. They're peaceful. They don't want any trouble. They just want somebody capable to chase these gnolls away. Your PCs stumble in. They mistakenly assume you're the one that's been hired to do it. Shenanigans uh, ensue. The goblins themselves, it's a fun way. Most people like flexing their goblin muscles, getting their silly goblin voices on, letting them do ridiculous things. My PCs brought a barrel of pickles and uh, bribed them with pickles to be their friends, not knowing that they were going to stumble into like somebody that was already waiting for them to be their friends. Um just remember, unlike most goblins, they're all sort of crafty inventors. They have little things. Kind of play up that thing. Like, if you look here, it's described in the book, but even their, like, sort of meat spigot, it has these bite pedals here, and you pedal them, and it, like, skewers the meat over the fire and puts this, like, roasting smell out. That's kind of a cool little touch here in Alcastar you can describe, right? Like, as the PCs come in, they see this cool contraption. The goblin's pedaling it. The meat's doing, like, an even turn, cooking all the way around. Uh, it just sets them apart from like your stereotypical dumb goblins, right? Um, these are not dumb by any means. They might not fit into what we consider society standards, but they are very creative, inventive goblins as a whole. Um, one fun little side quest here is for Monzi. Monzi is their lead inventor other than the leader, right? Lord Glass. And she said, I'm going to go take care of the gnolls myself. And she disappears and has been gone for a few days. So a little backstory here, which might help you. 
this giant airship, which now blocks the path from uh, the middle of the scrapyard, at one point, this was sticking straight up in the heat pile, right? It wasn't tipped over like this. Monzi's plan was to lure these knolls into this alley, and then using her big crane here, she knocked it over so that it would tumble onto the knolls and crush them. Unfortunately, it didn't work quite as well because when she toppled it, it fell a little slower and sort of more slid into place than crushed into place. And the gnolls were able to get away and laugh and are relatively happy just keeping this divide between the two. Um, but that sort of ingenuity and ultimately failure is Monzi, right? Monzi is the brains of this operation. She's the one uh, who kind of helped. I think it might actually have been Lord Glass who uh, filled this drain with rags so that the rainwater can collect and they would have fresh drinking water. Well, that worked until the whole thing got polluted and eventually created this rust ooze that we're going to talk about in a second because this is a TPK warning, rust ooze. Uh, <laughs> I think of like cars like, you know, Lightning McQueen, like, ru like uh, what is it? Like, um, he basically is the rust ease thing, but this is the rust ooze. Uh, but, um, Anyways, she's over here. She tried to, to turn on these clockworks, which is a recurring theme. Uh, the clockwork uh, defenders turning on their masters. She turned on these clockworks, and they started, she said, kill everyone! And they said, okay, and turned and tried to kill her, and she went, oh, and she ducked into her workshop and hid in a thing, and is surviving off of her, like, cockroaches and rat tails that she has. Um, the PCs can kind of rescue her. If they do, they get this fun ally in a goblin who A, um, is an alchemical genius and a crafting genius can make anything, right? Need alchemical stuff, they can come back and buy from Monzi. Need like, you know, healing potions, guess what? Monzi can make it. Uh, she can be that sort of like contact later in the adventure when they're like, oh, I really need like this cool device that can do X, Y, Z. Well, if they've rescued Monzi in their good terms with the nail gobblers, she can be a recurring NPC that you can bring back. Uh, and I, I, I like that sort of touch. And the art that they chose is very cute. Let me see if I can uh, bring it up real quick. Um, this is Monzi's art. The art in the book, there is no art for Monzi in the book. This art actually comes from a Starfinder character, believe it or not. It fits this sort of like look so well that I can't imagine Monzi any other way than this art right here. So this is part of the Foundry Premium module. But uh, my pe my players love Monzi, and I think if you want yours too, it's pretty easy to make it that way. So uh, the gnolls, right? The gnolls are behind this sort of ship, which has another big danger. Red alert. Woo -woo -woo. This machine can TPK your party. Um, you know, the gnolls, they're gnolls. They have pretty normal stat blocks. Jaws, bola, no like bows. Um, they get up close. They bite. They pack tactics. Uh, but what makes them interesting is the sort of weeping wounds because they're covered in these like flesh warp magic things, right? Um, anytime they're hit with a weapon, acid splashes back and you have to make a reflex save. Um, it's only like one damage or two on a crit fail, so it's not a lot, but it should you know keep your keep your PCs, your melee PCs on on the uh, their toes. And otherwise, they just have pack tactics, right? So extra d4 damage if they're in range of two of the gnolls allies there's four gnolls so if they if they swarm on the one and just bite they're gonna deal a little bit extra damage 1d4 at level one's nothing to sneeze at for sure otherwise they're pretty straightforward um in terms of their uh their combat capabilities but i need to come back here though back to this cool pool and that is because we're going to talk about the Rust Ooze. Uh, this Rust Ooze is a level 3 creature. Your PCs are level 1, so technically it's just two levels higher, right? It's not considered a severe encounter, but it might as well be because I feel like there's not as much wiggle room fighting a plus 2 monster at level 1. Um, this thing is a potential TPK beast. Most GMs that I've talked with have run a somewhat modified version of this encounter. Um... And so the, I'll, I'll tell you why it's so dangerous. And then you can look at your party's capabilities and you can know if maybe your party can handle this or not. So I talked back in the first episode about Alkenstar in general has magic that doesn't function normally. 
And in my party, we're running like no magic users, right? We're running the kind of the setting as it was originally intended, uh, more restrictive. Magic doesn't work properly in some places. This should be one of those places where it absolutely does not work. Uh, and so um, a lot of people might be leaning into those tropes and not running wizards, druids, things like that. That means most of you are going to be relying on uh, martial stuff, right? You're going to be relying on gunslingers. You're going to be relying on uh, swords and, and uh, things that fighters and rogues and investigators and things like that. Um, this thing is a, it's not hard to hit, right? It's got 11 AC. Easy to hit. You're going to hit on almost every swing you make, but it has um, this sort of uh, metal resistance. It has resistance five to all metal weapons. Almost everything you think of a, a level one party have is going to be metal. Swords, daggers, arrows, maces, uh, maybe not slings. Um, other than like clubs and stuff, they're going to have metal and it's going to resist five. And you're probably rolling like a, somewhere between like a D6 and a D8, maybe adding a little bit of bonus like strength damage. Um, but you're, you're really taking off a ton of health, a ton of hit. Um, if you're talking like a gunslinger, right, who's rolling like a D4, they're never going to be able to get through that resistance. Uh, and so the first thing I'm going to say, make sure you really call this out that around the edges of the scrapyard, these piles, there are woods. Your PCs can reach in and withdraw a club and hit this thing with their club, right? Um, that's really the only way most of your martial PCs are going to get through this sort of damage. Um, that's not even taking into consideration the fact that whenever it hits someone, it can like damage their armor and make it break. Or whenever you hit it with your weapon, it can splash back and actually hurt your weapon, right? Um, it can actually kill your your PC's gears if you're not careful. Um, the reason this thing actually becomes so dangerous here is on top of being immune, or sorry, resistance 5 to all metal, it is cr immune to critical hits, immune to mental damage, immune to precision damage. That means... Okay, so this this is actually brings us back to a debate, what it means. But basically, it's immune to critical hit. So even though its AC is low, even though your PCs are generally going to critical hit it, they're not going to get that boost in critical hit damage. So they're not going to be able to bypass that 5 resistance. It's like if you roll a D6 and you roll 2D6, maybe you're going to get through that 5 damage. You're not going to roll the 2D6. And because they're immune to precision damage, you know, rogues, investigators, uh, swashbucklers, people who rely on that precision damage are boned. You're not going to be able to deal anything to it. Uh, people like gunslingers or fighters or anyone that relies on critical hits to deal extra damage, you're not dealing extra damage on critical hits. Guess what? You're also not getting through that resistance. If you have a spellcaster, especially like anyone that can do lightning damage, uh, electric arc is the most commonly taken sort of primal and arcane cantrip. This thing has a weakness five to electricity. So, you know, electric arc will deal a ton of damage to this thing and really hurt it. That's cool. It's a bag of hit points at 80 hit points with this thing. It really has an effective health pool of like 150 plus damage. Um, unless your party has ways to deal electric damage or elemental damage consistently, you're going to have to come up with creative solutions to let your party bypass this. But let me back up for one second. There is sort of this debate, which I got pulled into because of this monster, and I didn't realize it at the time, which is, um, critical hit immunity and what it actually means raw, like red as, red as written versus red as intended. My, It's very clear to me the intention of something being immune to critical hits means things that trigger on critical hits don't trigger, right? If, you, if, a, if I have a fatal D10 firearm and I crit, I upgrade my D4 to a D10 and then I add an extra D10. Or if I'm deadly, right, I just add an extra D8 to my, like, rapier strike, right? Because it's immune to critical hits, I would imagine you don't add those extra bits of damage to it because it's not a critical hit, right? However, if you go read the actual entry for critical hit immunity in the creatures, all it says is, on a critical hit, do not double the damage dice. But that doesn't mean don't add other... It doesn't specifically say... Don't do other stuff that happens on a critical hit. 
Deadly trait says on a critical hit, add an extra dice of damage. That's not doubling damage dice. So as written, you would get to add the extra dice here. And if that's the case, then you run this in that manner, then you're going to get the extra damage. You're going to get through this immunity a little better. So it's probably better to allow the critical hit effects other than doubling the damage dice to apply against this creature just to help out your party. I don't think that's intended to be how the rules are. And it's been clarified in like some of the other YouTube videos who have delved into this topic, as well as like supposedly from some of the Pathfinder devs directly saying, no, that's not the way we intended it to work. However, it is the way it's written it would work. So it's the ultimate of the decision you as a GM is gonna have to make if you allow critical hit effects other than the doubling damage to apply, especially weapons traits here against the rust dues or against any critical hit immune use, right? Creature. Me, I fall in the camp of critical hits don't happen because it has nothing, there are no critical spots to hit. There's no weak points. So you shouldn't get extra damage on a gunshot because there's nothing like sensitive to hit, which is what it's supposed to be flavoring. But your mileage may vary. So with that out of the way, allow creative solutions, right? Um, it talks about how if the PCs, because it is in this water thing, one of the advantages the PCs have is that it's slow. It has a speed, uh, a swim speed of 30 feet, but a regular speed of only 15 feet. So if the PCs kite it, they can kite it around the scrapyard pretty easily, right? The problem is they're going to run out of space pretty fast before they can kite it. And this large water pool, it has a speed of 30 swim, and it can swim within this pool anywhere. So it can cover the whole pool really fast. So, of course, these rags can be drained either by walking out and pulling them up or by using this crane to bring it over and pick up the, the rags, um, which if you, um, if you, let me drain this real quick. If you drain the water, right, run that macro. If you drain the water, uh, I'll just delete this so you can see it. If you drain the water, now the rust ooze is slow and it can be kited sort of in a circle around here easier. Um, which maybe, but it, it, even if that happens, it's still a long drawn out sort of boring fight. Ooh, look at that Versace hovercraft, our sponsor molten hosting, stepping in and gifting five subs to our chat during our GM prep stream. Thank you Versace hovercraft and thanks molten hosting for all the awesomeness they give us. You're awesome for stepping in and doing that. Um, in this case where the, uh, the rust is can be kited around easily, it's still not a very fun fight. It's just going to take a long time, a lot of rolling dice. So, um, some people are allowing the, uh, the drain to be picked up and the ooze gets drained down into the drain with it and let it get rid of it that way. Um, my PCs, they picked up this giant metal box and dropped it onto the ooze. Uh, now that's to be said, my inventor had her companion, who was all metal, sacrifice her companion by letting the ooze eat it, and then as it was distracted by eating it, dropped the box on it and smashed it, losing her invention in the process. So they had a big opportunity cost, but they paid it, and they I let them beat this because they didn't have a chance otherwise. Um, the other thing to remember here, this is not a smart creature. In fact, it's literally mindless. All it really wants is to feed on metal. Now, it doesn't have any sense other than movement sense, right? So it doesn't even have blind sense. It just has motion sense. So if your PCs were to stand perfectly still, it probably wouldn't even know that they were there. It's only the movement that allows them to be tracked. So it has a feast around it. All these metal, this box, the crane, everything around it is this meal that it doesn't know about. So if they were to, say, lure the rust ooze towards the metal, they're going to be more interested in devouring this wall or this box than they are a PC, unless you're talking about a robotic PC companion, in which case maybe that's going to go. Um, but, you know, it, it's really looking for the most metal stuff it can eat. And that's how I would play it. Let your party get creative. Otherwise, you're probably going to TPK. All right. Um... Let's talk about the other big, big danger, and that is the haunt here, this lone, this machine spirit. Um, as written, this is not a creature, it is a haunt 
The haunt embodies the engine of the ship. It is created out of the love that the pilot had for this ship. And it's weird to have a haunt that's a machine haunt. You can play up that angle. But I'm just going to talk about purely statistics, right? It's a level 3 hazard. We already know level 1 versus level 3. This is the third level 3 creature they're facing at level 1. If anyone approaches this engine, right, there's a stealth 13 trained, which means, A, the PCs have to be taking the search action to even have a chance at this, right? And B, they need to hit a 23 perception check, which with PCs that have like a plus 5 perception, you're still looking at like an 18 plus on the dice. They're not going to see this. It's going to be an amazing chance to see this as written. Um, if anyone approaches, there's a painful whistle, a sonic a reaction that blows goes out any creatures within 30 feet have to make a basic fortitude save or take 2d6 sonic damage with the dc 20 now a standard dc at level one is dc 15 so a dc 20 at level one they're gonna fail almost everyone's gonna fail and you're gonna get some critical fails probably too if you critically fail you're gonna get stunned and you're taking double 2d6 damage you're gonna go out your pcs are knocked unconscious on the triggering of this haunt and then it rolls initiative and then it shoots red hot gears out of the engine that hit for 1d6 bludgeoning and 1d6 fire damage with a plus 12 strike they're going to get hit it can easily tpk your party and how do you deal with it well you attack it right with a 20 ac and a hardness of 11 which means you have to deal more than 11 points of damage to even hurt it along with its critical hit immunity and object immunity, precision damage, weakness, or like like before, right? The same problem we have with the ooze. If you're not dealing electricity damage or anything like that, you're not going to get through. You're not going to be able to damage it physically. So what does that leave us with? Well, that leaves us with the ability to deactivate the haunt. Now, haunts are usually dealt with by religion, right? So anyone trained in religion, and let's face it, Outlaws of Alkenstar is not, not really one where you would expect religion to play like a big uh a big deal in fact i'm pretty sure it wasn't listed in the uh the player's guide i'm double checking right now uh, let's see um alkenstar players guide let me switch over this so you can see it real quick if we look at the player's guide thing right what is what skills are recommended religion is under appropriate but it's not high up it's not going to get a lot of play in the adventure path. This is one case where it probably probably will, right? Um, so a DC-22, even if they're trained and even if they have a plus four religion, right? That means they're getting at most plus seven to this check, which means they still need to roll a 15 or higher. So they only have like what? Like a 30% chance of success. Um if they succeed, it ejects it. Um, it's a little easier with crafting, right? Because, it, well, it's actually engineering lore. Then they like literally fiddle some gears and shoot the ghost out of it. Uh, that, that lowers the DC to a 20. I would consider letting your PCs use crafting if they don't have engineering lore. Uh, just allow them to do a crafting check and have the DC also be a 22. Um, really, this is, this is the part. It's buried deep in the sort of text that gms might gloss over and that is these bonuses that they can get to helping to exercise the demon right the spirit so if the pcs know the airship's name they get a plus two to this check regardless of if it's a religion tech or a crafting check engineering lore check plus two just for knowing the ship's name in this case on the map in foundry it very clearly says the harpy's kiss just tell your players as they approach they can see the name of the ship on the side if they connect the dots if they make a recall knowledge check about dealing with spirits let them know simply using the name of the ship is going to give them a bonus then you can also tease like maybe you might know something about the ship if they make another recall knowledge check let them go into their alkenstar lore or their uh airship lore or any sort of lore so they can justify and let them see if they know anything about this ship right if they get the name Pharaoh Winslow, it gives them a plus four bonus. That brings, you know, the 15 we need down to an 11 or higher, which gives them a 50% chance instead of a 25, 30% chance of succeeding. And that is really going to make it more manageable. Um, 
The other thing is I would potentially maybe scale back the red hot gears to do one attack instead of two. Um, if your PCs are in trouble, uh, try to like be nice about not hitting the entire group of PCs with a sonic blast at the start, right? Fudge that a little bit. Um, and, and this can actually turn into like a fun encounter. Um, it has some cool bones there. The Pharaoh Winslow is a sort of call forward to foreshadowing something that happens in book two. So this all comes back around and that's cool, but it's not going to be cool if you TPK your party. Um, make sure you understand how to get the bonuses to the check, help your PCs get those bonuses for the check, you know, let, lead them towards the roles, allow them to make the roles. If they can't come up with the info, you know, then they're on their own. Um, I would at least give them the name, the Harvey's kits and allow them to then make a recall knowledge or to know to use the name to help exercise the spirit. Um, the Leshy fight, you know, they're, it's pretty basic. All you need to know is like when, um, the, the fungus Leshy can make like a poison persistent cloud around it as well. Anytime they die, they do that verdant burst. It's a 30 foot emanation. So let me just show you how big that is, right? If this creature dies, it makes a huge ring like that which heals other leshies in the in the emanation so it, it really teaches them to focus fire one enemy and not spread their damage because when one dies the other ones get healed um that's really the the most creative thing about this fight and as the book says feel free to skip it if your pcs are just over it at this point but bristlebane she's the final boss of the dungeon if your PCs are like mine, they're going to get to here. They're going to beat the Leshies. They're going to see the exit, and they're going to make a beeline for it. Despite the fact they're injured and hobbling, they're going to like, let's get out of here. They run for the exit. And at that point, you're, of course, saying, oh, well, now you hear something coming out of the sewer. And now it's too late. They don't have the 10 minutes to stop and do a, a medicine check or heal themselves up. Um, so sort of telegraph that this is coming, allow them to hide, potentially. Uh, regardless, Bristlebane is... A, what we call a glass cannon she's only a moderate she's only a level two creature we're not doing a level three ending boss fight thankfully she's only level two she doesn't have a lot of hit points 16 ac 40 hit points it's respectable but she will go down if she doesn't win an initiative most likely she will die before she gets her turn it just takes one lucky crit from your pcs to make it happen but if she does get to go she has some amazing offensive tools um, these two actions in particular are really what we're looking at. Um, you know, she has a whip, a plus one whip. She can use the, the plus one's already in her stat block. Um, you can trip all that, but I would focus on moving into position and using these two actions. One's a two actions and one's a three action ability. So let's talk about express meal. Bristol Bane, she makes an attack roll against a creature within reach and her reach is 10 feet, right? With, um, with the whip, um, Make one melee strike within reach. On a success, she pulls them in next to her and bites them. The bite does increase her multiple attack penalty, but it doesn't actually bump up until after the attack's made. So if if she moves and then does like that, it's basically Scorpion from Mortal Kombat, right? Get over here, whip, pull in, and then uppercut, or in this case, bite. So uh, that's going to really catch your... your uh, PCs off guard, somebody who thinks they're like safe range or whatever, goes out, whips, pulls it in, bites, pulls them out of position, really makes them panic. Uh, a bite, you know, her, her whip is going to be a D4 plus 5. Her uh, jaws is a D6 plus 5. If they both hit, you're looking at potentially downing someone, right, like that. Um, but if she can, if she's already in position, like let's say she rolls last, they surround her, or some reason she survives for a second turn in combat, she has this move called Whip Whirlwind. It takes three full actions, mind you, but it allows her to use her whip to disarm, strike, or to trip every creature within range. She does take a minus two penalty on that, that roll. Okay, no big deal. Uh, but it doesn't increase her multiple attack penalty until all of it is done, right? So if all four PCs are around her, she can do four strikes. That's going to scare the hell out of all PCs because she like whips it around. Or maybe she trips one, disarms another, strikes somebody. Uh, now, the disarm is always a weaker option. It takes a critical success to actually knock it, something out of someone's hands. But like, it's still an option, right? Uh, she doesn't have the, the free action to then pick it up if she did. 
it could be even better. Um, but tripping and striking is really going to to strike fear in your players. Uh, and just like the other gnolls, she has weeping wounds, so they hit her. It splashes back and deals damage back to them. Um, most likely what's going to happen is your PCs are going to be really scared about the final boss of the dungeon and pleasantly surprised at how much, how easily they're able to dispatch her, which kind of leads on like a nice high note and transitions out of the scrapyard and to the end of chapter one. Um, there is one more, um, in chapter one, there is one more uh, scene that plays at the end. They've made it this far. Some groups can get through this whole thing in one session. If you're like me, it took four or five sessions to even get to the end of this. I think most groups will probably do like one or two to get through chapter one. Um, there's a lot going on, depending on how much you let players skip how much role play they do and how fast they make their decisions in combat. But at the end of it, uh, there's a close call because Angelique has been chasing them, right? As they're going through the sewers, oh, and, and mechanically speaking, uh, thematically speaking, this Noel Bristlebane has a hand-drawn map of the sewers. The PCs can get that map and now they can navigate the sewers to go from this scrapyard underneath the city and actually come up into Alkenstar proper past the city walls in and sort of has this really big dangerous entry point that anyone who knows about it could use to attack the city um but now they have a way in and out of the city um which can allow them to go back to like monzi and all that without dealing with shield marshals um if you want but anyways they get to the end uh make sure you do this scene right uh, they get, as they're leaving, they hear Loveless above. It's a one-sided conversation, but she's talking about setting up the next thing. Uh, Vashon Gattleby is a, somebody, a name that gets dropped, and she says, like, we're going to grab him. You have four days, five days. We're grabbing him in five days. Hurry it up. Um, meanwhile, look for these outlaws that just robbed us, and if you find them, kill them, right? They, the PC should know the law is looking for them. If they were already on anyone's radar, they're now full-on outlaws. They've robbed a bank. And uh, despite how good they think they were before, they are definitely thieves for life now. And that caps off the entirety of Chapter 1. Once you uh, once you get here... Um, let me go back to this screen. Once you get back here, you are able to... Uh, We've gotten through the first, well, minus the beginning matter. Um, we've gotten all the way through, we're all the way to chapter 28 by the time we get here. And we get to run and gun. But in the meantime, we are here um, at chapter one, reach for the sky. And that's it. That's chapter one. Um, if anyone in chat has any active questions uh, for me, this would be a good time to shout them out. Either chapter one, anything related uh, in later chapters, I have read generally through the entirety of the adventure path, so I have a high-level understanding of everything, um, mostly deeper understanding of the first book, especially. Um, feel free to shout out any questions in chat. In the meantime, I will just give one more shout-out to our patrons who make this possible. Thank you, David Sims, Derek Brewer, Sandra Wagner, Mikkel Waltz, and Jason Irvin. You guys are the real heroes, allowing us to... Uh, do this sort of content that we love and the, um, and hopefully you guys enjoyed this chapter. doesn't look like I have any straight up questions. I know Miwa was making jokes about the salty rusty monster. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the salty party who gets TPK'd by the rust monster. Definitely. Um, I'd be interested in running it straight up and just seeing how, how well a martial party could even fare against that thing. Um, yeah, it doesn't look like there's a ton of questions, so I think that's going to do it. I hope you have enjoyed this live. If you're watching this later on YouTube, uh, take time to support us on both platforms, youtube.com slash recallknowledge. Subscribe um, and uh, you know hit the little bell so you can get our future videos. I do plan to release these biweekly. Um, and if you're watching this on YouTube, head on over to Twitch. Subscribe on twitch.tv. We're running Outlaws of Alkstar, which is this adventure path, every Wednesday at 7 p.m. As our outlaws are uh, tangling with, uh, you know, some interesting uh, moral questions, especially because we got a, some party members that are nicer than others, um, or a lot more lawful than others. 
and uh, we just finished chapter one a few weeks ago. We are in the midst of chapter two now, so if you want to see how any of this plays out in an actual play format, head on over on our YouTube um, and look for Outlaws of Alkenstar, you know, episodes one through like six or so cover, uh, maybe five or six covers this whole chapter and you can kind of see them in chunks. So Miwa says, I don't actually have any questions, but if we can actually access some way the images you're using for monsters that don't have art on the book, it would be super appreciated. So if you're running this on Foundry, like I am, if you buy the Punks in a Powder Keg module, uh, the premium module, it's sold at Paizo's website. It's the official module that plugs right into Foundry. The people there over at... Um, Oh man, what was, I need to look this up. What was the name of the, uh, there is a, uh, let me see. Uh, there's a company that made it and they were contracted by, uh, oh, Sigil Entertainment. Sorry for Sigil Entertainment, but I forgot your name for a second. Sigil Entertainment was contracted, they made this they were given access to Paizo's entire artwork library, right? And they used all the artwork that was official, and they went and found official Paizo art from other sources to fill in the blanks. Now, unfortunately, we can't... I, I don't have any rights to distribute the art that is, um, that is here. Um, I know... I think I have a pretty good idea of where the rest of it comes. If you're doing it on a foundry, it comes with it. If you want, if you have the PDF, you can buy the Foundry uh, version for like $7, I think. If you install this module into your Foundry world, you can then extract all the images and use them at your home table or anything like that. But otherwise, um, if you come into like the Discord, if there's any of the art that you saw here that you're actually interested in, I can try to find out like what source it came from and we might be able to find it on like Archives of Nethys or... or um, at least point you to the direction where the artwork came from because I agree they filled the gaps so well in this module for the the NPCs we don't have art for, like the the Leshies or Monzi or um, there's some more later on that look really cool. Uh, I think it's worth supporting Sigil and buying this, and I think running it in Foundry if you're running it online is definitely the way to go. Um, Otherwise, like uh, Miwa if, or like Mikel, if you want to hop onto the Discord and if there's any specific art you're looking for, I can try to point you in the right direction. I just can't legally distribute all the artwork, unfortunately. So I think that's going to do it for my stream tonight. Um, thanks for joining me on Outlaws of Alkenstar, uh, uh, episode one, uh, sorry, episode two, chapter one. Um, if you know, in YouTube, if you guys have any questions later on, feel free to ask them down below. I will try to answer questions I get, um, joining our discord and in discord, if you're on YouTube, you can just look in the link down below. If you're in Twitch right now, I'm putting the discord link. Joining our discord is the best way to ask me directly. There's a section for outlaws of Alchemstar and a GM prep channel. You can ask there. Um, if you are a Patreon subscriber or a Twitch subscriber, you get access to our special channels and you can ask, uh, you can ask about, uh, anything in the channel in a more direct route and, uh, personal contact with us, um, in the whole cast. And, um, that's really the best way to keep in contact with us. But otherwise, I hope you enjoy this episode. Uh, I'll be back next time. We're going to be covering chapter th two, which is called Run and Gun, which is sort of a prolonged escort mission as you escort Gattleby across the uh, the city. So anyways, uh, I hope you found this informative. I hope you found this fun. Like, subscribe, share, comment, help us grow. Subscribe to our Patreon. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you later. Goodbye. Hi, Steve from Recall Knowledge here. If you enjoyed this content, please make sure to like and subscribe down below so you can get notified of more awesome content coming your way. Also, make sure to follow our channel's Twitter, at Recall Knowledge, for the latest information. Thanks for watching.